Hello and good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you this month's E4C webinar focusing on some startup lessons from our colleagues at Husk Power Systems. Today's webinar is called Adapt to Thrive, an Energy Startup Reboot. My name is Yana Aranda and I'm the President of Engineering for Change and I'll be serving as today's moderator. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs for those channels are listed here. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. And E4C members will receive invitations to those upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, we encourage you to contact the E4C webinars team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join us in our conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, technologists, designers, global development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, which we'll be talking about today, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you act, interact with our site, the better we'll be able to serve you resources aligned to your needs. We invite you to visit our website to learn more and sign up. Now, if you're interested in learning more about energy solutions, trying to bridge the electrical infrastructure gaps in low-income settings, we invite you to explore the E4C Solutions Library after the webinar. An example of the type of technology you'll find is what you see on this slide. This solution is, in fact, what will be discussed at length by today's presenter, as it is the original Husk Power Systems biomass gasification power plant. In addition to what you hear today, you can explore the full report on the system in the Solutions Library. This report provides more information about technical performance, academic research, user provision models, and other details for the system. All the information is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. And most importantly, it is available to E4C members free of charge. Now, it's very, uh, some very important housekeeping items before we get started. We'd like to take a moment to practice using the WebEx platform. Please right now type into the chat window uh, what part of the world you're joining us from. The chat window is located at the bottom right of your screen. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon on the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. I'll get us going as well here in New York. All right, so we have some folks from New York City for sure, from Canada. I know we have some folks joining us from Portland as well as Denver and Michigan. Um, we also, I know folks are dialing in from India, and uh, we have some folks uh, from um, Rhode Island. So lots of great locations today. Keep your answers coming. Um, just so that you are aware, um, the chat window is meant for interaction with the other participants as well as for any general questions. However, we would like for you to use uh, the uh, Q&A window which is located just below the chat window to type in additional questions for the presenters to be able to keep track of that. Again, if you do not see the Q&A window, please uh, click the icon that is in the bottom of the screen right in the middle of the slides for that and you should be able to access it. So some more, um, more uh, replies here, folks from the Netherlands, uh, India again, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, after the webinar, to access uh, your professional development hour, particularly for engineers who require those, 
Uh, please follow the instructions on your member dashboard to access the PH form or click the link that you see on the slide right here to request that. And with this, I'd like to turn it over to our fantastic presenter, Manoj Singha, who is the co-founder and CEO of Husk Power Systems. He has strong leadership skills with a proven track record of turning around a business, risk management, change management, and ability to bring a diverse team in multiple countries together to achieve a common vision. Mr. Singha has extensive experience developing strategy and execution across multiple industries, including renewable energy, energy policies for national electrification, and the financial services industry. His work history includes over a decade of experience in negotiating and deal making, raised equity and debt capital from a spectrum of investors. He's formed partnerships from startups to Fortune 500 companies to government institutions. Additionally, he has been invited as a speaker and panelist in multiple countries, and now here uh, online with E4C, and has spoken on multiple topics, including access to energy for rural people, energy policy, risk management of financial assets, and credit risk. We're incredibly honored to have Manoj join us today. I'm going to turn it over to him. All right. And Manoj, please take it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Yana. I hope you all can hear me okay. I had to shut down my video because my internet connectivity is very, very poor. Uh, I am absolutely entirely from uh, Patna in India. Uh, that happens to be my hometown and home state. Uh, that's the great thing. The bad thing is the internet is really slow. Uh, so uh, I think from a presentation perspective, I will probably talk a little bit about my background and that will set up the context for you know what the Husk Power Systems is uh, company and why did I really start the company? Uh, so, like I was saying earlier, I was born in uh, Bihar, a state in India that has roughly 110 million people in population. And when I started this idea. Uh, 70 to 80 million people did not have electricity at all. And at the time I was in the US, I was enjoying my uh, good life, I should say. Uh, but I still had this uh, nagging thing in my mind that my own people in my own home state uh, are still suffering. And I'm talking about 2007 and 8 timeframe. Uh, from lack of electricity, I'm an engineer as an electrical engineer. So I guess I was left with no option but to solve that problem. Uh, so that was the genesis of why uh, I started with in my own home in India uh, to essentially solve the problem for people in the rural areas by providing them with 24 uh, 7 power and at an affordable price point that they can use uh, to replace kerosene or diesel or what have you. So that's, that's really the background of why uh, we started this company in 2008. Uh, when we started this company in 2008, uh, we looked at a variety of technology and uh, I used to work with Intel Corporation back then in the US. So semiconductor was quite easy for me to understand. Therefore, we started looking at solar PV as a technology of choice to do what we wanted to do, which is to provide electricity to people in the rural areas uh, in India. So uh, we looked at that and then we realized uh, it was very expensive. Uh, if some of you track or look at the price of solar panels, uh, you may not, but uh, just so that you know, in 2008, solar panels used to sell for $5 per watt uh, as compared to 25 to 30 cents, US cents, that is, uh, per watt now. That's the kind of price uh, that has changed over the last 10 years, uh, you know, less than one-tenth of what it used to be uh, in 2000. Uh, so given that uh, high price, uh, we actually ended up picking biomass gasification 
as a, as a technology uh, choice for us. Uh, and before I go into too much uh, detail about the technology piece, what we really do is we build these uh, small power plants, which are not more than 50 kilowatt in size typically, and we lay out wires and poles that span a distance of about a mile, mile and a half at the most. And in that, that radius, uh, we serve roughly 200 to 300 customers that are residential, uh, small businesses, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was our model that we envisioned, or you can say pioneered in 2008. Uh, so the whole idea or goal was to build these decentralized power plant distribution assets and uh, people. And one of the reasons why we did or come up with that idea is because in India, again, back in 2008, uh, all the cities will always be prioritized above the rural uh, areas, right? So if there's a finite amount of power that India was generating, uh, the rural people will always get the, you know, uh, prioritized the last, and therefore they will get electricity at odd hours, like between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., when nobody really needs it. Uh, so that th that's the problem that we encountered, and we wanted to solve that by creating this decentralized asset or business or mini grid in our case that has only one priority, which is people in that 1.5 mile radius. Right. So that that was why we came up with decentralized uh, energy uh, business model. Uh, Fast forward to now, if you guys follow uh, uh, energy space at all, or if you at least followed PG&E uh, fiasco recently in California, uh, they shut down two million people. Uh, they are talking about decentralized renewable assets because that can be much more resilient uh, to things like uh, fires and and cyclones and what have you. Uh, so I'll pause there. Uh, so essentially that was, those were the issues that we were looking at. And that's why we built this company, Hub Power Systems, that solves the problem of those people who live in the rural areas as a priority, provide them with reliable and renewable power at an affordable price point so that they can do well. Uh, and in return, we do well as well, uh, both from business perspective as in profitability, and of course, we create a lot of impact uh, while doing that. Uh, uh, fast forward to today, uh, we, we are running 70 hybrid mini grid systems uh, in India and Tanzania. Uh, interestingly, I could not spell India correctly. Right? It says Indi, uh, it is India. Uh, so uh, that's what we are doing today. Uh, and we are actually, in terms of mini grid space, we are the world's lowest cost uh, provider as compared to any other that is uh, out there in the sector. Uh, and recently, which is about the only closed uh, CDC round of financing, which was $25 million uh, from a great set of investors that includes Shell. Uh, Shell has a new energy part, so Shell New Energies. Uh, NG, uh, Sweat Fund, and uh, FMO. Uh, and yeah, so these are the four investors that came in in 2018. Uh, interestingly, all of them are from Europe, uh, which might be an indication that they're a little bit more forward looking when it comes to uh, clean tech uh, and uses of uh, non conventional sources of energy. Uh, so this is uh, just to uh, reestablish what the problem statement we are dealing with. So if you look at the numbers on on your right side of the screen, uh, you know, the most often quoted numbers are between 850 million to a billion people without access to power. Uh, we define the problem even uh, larger because there are additional 1 to 1.3 billion people who do not have access to reliable power, which is equally or even more painful. 
So if you're getting power for six to eight hours, what are you really going to do? How can you plan anything when you get 10 hours of power and you have no idea when you, when you get that power, right? So our problem statement that we are trying to solve as a company is not just off-grid, but also weak grid or people connected to the weak grid uh, system. Uh, the, and I think I have uh, done an underestimate uh, about $70 billion gets spent on uh, diesel and kerosene and, and candles uh, in the rural parts of Africa and Asia. Uh, I think it's much larger than that. Because the recent numbers that are coming out about number of or millions of diesel gensets that run in these two continents is just enormous. Uh, and therefore, the market size, uh, both from number of people who are adversely impacted because of lack of access to power and the money that they spend on really dirty sources of energy is very, very large, right? Uh, uh, you know, on our earth, we have about seven odd billion people and one third of that do not have access to uh, reasonable and reliable power. So that's what really excited us uh, other than uh, solving the problem for my own home state when we started the company. And as you can see on the on the chart, on, on your left-hand side, uh, the y-axis is uh, GDP per capita, and x-axis is uh, energy consumption per capita. So if you're from uh, United States or Canada, the, the energy per capita is quite high, uh, and so is, of course, GDP per capita. So uh, the correlation between energy uses and wealth is significantly high. Uh, I think nobody has proven the causation, uh, but correlation between these two uh, variables are pretty much uh, indication of where the wealth is or how the wealth can be created. And one of the levers is to create more energy uses, more for productive purposes. So that's the problem statement. I'm going to run quickly through this uh, slide, which talks about uh, some of the economies that we are targeting, including India, a few countries in East Africa. We are already present in Tanzania, uh, and we are looking at Nigeria as a market. Uh, so this is a little bit of a dated slide, uh, 2016, but that market size annual spend on energy uses is roughly $7 billion. Uh, so based on you know the problem statement that we talked about and how and why we really wanted to start the company in 2008, uh, we defined our vision statement to be the world's largest rural utility company providing 24/7 renewable and affordable power that enables socio-economic development, and it has to happen at scale. So we did not start the company to do two or 20 or 200 villages. We started the company to hopefully do 200 or solve problem for 200,000 villages, or at least 20,000 villages, if not 200,000. Uh, and what is really uh, what I really want uh, you to take away from this is you know, we do not consider electricity as as something that we provide. We really consider electricity as a tool that we provide to people that they can use in the most effective way they see fit in order to improve their life or increase their income or both. So residential customers or households, of course, they switch from kerosene to uh, you know, our mini grid lighting and therefore their life, you know, life generally improves because they have light whenever they want it and they can you know, use it for television and things of that nature to, to lead a uh, life that you and I are, are uh, you know, very comfortable with, and we don't even think twice about it. And for, we really now focus on productive uses of power. So people who are running small shops or might want to run a small carpentry shop or a small factory that has a wheat grinding machine, that's the area that we really focus on because that's where the income increases significant once they connect to us. And that's why you know, our vision statement captures socioeconomic development at scale by providing electricity as a tool. 
so that people can use it to, to prosper. Uh, this is um, kind of a bragging thing, but we won last year a global clean tech 100 company, uh, which was a, a great stamp of approval, I think, for us in terms of what we are doing or what uh, we have been doing for now 10 years. Uh, so what, what does our uh, uh, utility uh, look like, right? So we have, like I was saying earlier, we build these small power plants that are 50 kilowatt in size. So we have solar PV that provides power during daytime. We have biomass gasification system that provides power during evening time, which is between say 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Then we have battery as a backup that provides power for the remainder period of night, right? Say from 11 p.m. to next morning. And battery acts as a backup if and when there is rain or uh, things of that nature so that people or our customers are not adversely impacted and they get 24-7 power no matter what. Uh, so uh, for some of you who may not be aware of what biomass gasification is, uh, it's quite a simple process. It was discovered, I think, uh, during World War II or even before World War II. Um, it takes biomass waste as the feedstock in our case, rice husk, uh, at a feedstock the gasification chamber, which is a pyrolysis process. So a plate is heated to 800 degrees Celsius under an oxygen condition that is not a whole lot of oxygen, so it doesn't burn. And at that temperature, it starts generating gas, which is called gas or producer gas. Uh, that we take out, uh, pull it down, filter it out, and feed it to an engine or modified CNG engine uh, that is then connected to an uh, alternator that generates electricity. So that's how that gasification process works. So we are using this system or this combination because uh, our mandate is to generate 100% renewable power. We could have used diesel genset at night time, uh, but we chose not to. One, that most importantly, it is a uh, renewable source of energy. Uh, I talked about transmission and distribution. We run uh, poles and wires that follows national standards uh, up to a distance of 1.5 miles or two kilometers in each direction. And our customers are connected through smart prepaid meters. And uh, that is key to reducing theft rate to zero, uh, which is a pretty big problem in India. So one of the biggest problems that uh, companies face or distribution companies face in India uh, is a lot of theft and transmission and distribution losses that makes big distribution companies actually uh, uh, not profitable. They lose money. So in India, there are about 20 plus distribution companies. And at an aggregate level, they lose about $25 billion annually. Uh, so that, that's the kind of uh, problem that exists in this market uh, because of both TN uh, distribution losses, but also because of uh, theft. And we solve that by using this local uh, uh, network as well as smart prepaid metering system. Uh, so we, I think I touched upon this as well. Uh, what we really excel in is not providing or producing electrons, which we do, uh, and 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 take it to uh, individual customers' premises. What we really excel in is to identify each customer segment that we can serve and serve them extremely well. And what do I mean by that? So for example, I talked about we have solar PV for daytime supply. And solar PV is the cheapest energy source in that mix. So when our customers, say households or shops or factories are using our energy during daytime, say between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., we actually provide a discounted tariff rate to these customers 
so that they can take advantage of lower cost of energy that we are producing at that time. And we can do that because we have a smart prepaid metering system. Uh, so I also uh, live in Fort Collins, Colorado in the U.S. And uh, for city of Fort Collins utility, we introduced time of day pricing last year. Uh, the time of day price uh, so in some way although we are catering only to customers uh, that may be a perspective but what we have in is smart bread with smart prepaid metering system uh, that is in my opinion much better than most of the companies that I know of in the United States mostly from uh, tariff management etc perspective Uh, this, you know, th these are just customer data that we are really proud of. Uh, like I was saying, we really take a lot of pride in serving our customers well. And uh, you know, this customer uh, is one of our first customers that received 24/7 uh, power. And uh, when he received 24/7 power, uh, his energy use has increased by 100 percent, and his sales are. Uh, uh, overall money that he was making increased by four times. Uh, so these are the things that we get really excited about. Of course, we provide a strong response, which is great, but the customer stories are the ones that really excite us. Um, so that's uh, our Story in the in the village, what we have observed is that energy is quite substantial, uh, and we have observed 50% increase in the energy use of power. Uh, we see some uh, energy use from month 10 to month 12, and that is a winter drop. But overall, there is increase in energy consumption. Uh, so that's uh, and before I, I go further into this particular slide or or deck, uh, what I wanted to talk about is. Uh, which is, I guess, the topic of this conversation is uh, how did we reach here? Right. So I talked in the beginning about uh, us, our, our founders, starting the company with biomass gasification as uh, as a system. Uh, so in 2008, uh, when we did biomass gasification system, because of the technical uh, limitation, we were able to do six to eight hours of power with biomass application system only and uh, we were primarily serving uh, residential customers because commercial customers needed to be served in daytime as well uh, and we did that quite well we actually raised our series a round of financing in 2010 uh, uh, sorry uh, seed round of financing in 2010 and uh, series a round of financing in 2012 uh, with these financing, we scaled quite rapidly from a couple of systems in 2008 to more than 70 systems by 2013. Um, and these are, uh, let me quickly uh, uh, stop. So, do you guys want me to answer some of the questions that are coming, or I should do? Uh, no, let's let's go. Yeah, let's wait till the end for questions. We'll tackle everything at the end. Otherwise, it might impact our time overall. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so our journey was, you know, we started with a business model with a biomass gasification system. We did quite well. We expanded our footprint from, you know, two or three systems to seventy systems uh, in less than uh, two or three years after we received the money. Uh, when we were doing that, uh, we were not uh, watching a few things that we should have been watching, and our business model started sort of crumbling down or collapsing. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, we had more than 12,000 customers uh, across these 70 sites, and what we started observing was people who were happy with us in 2010 or 2011, they were not quite satisfied with what we were providing them in 2013. 
or early 2014. Uh, and the reason behind that was, you know, people were happy with six to eight hours of power in 2010, but with development and aspirational changes, uh, our customers were aspiring to get on demand or 24 seven power. And we were way too busy with our own products and replicating it. And we really sort of forgot to listen what customers were really demanding. Right, so that was one thing that we missed and we made, uh, we can call that as a pretty big mistake. And the second thing was, despite the fact that, you know, actually two of us, two founders of the company, we were both in solar or semiconductor industry, we had evaluated solar PV technology in 20, uh, 2008, but we did not keep track of that. And then realized in 2013 and 2014 that the solar prices had come down quite a bit. Uh, in 2013, the solar PV prices were down to a dollar per watt as compared to $5 per watt in 2008. So those were the two major trends that we missed. And that's why we were looking at our business model that worked really well uh, in 2008, 9, 10, and so on and so forth, started really falling apart in 2013 and 14. That was a pretty big setback for us. Uh, we were quite well known uh, as one of the largest mini grid companies back then. Then we had our most uh, highly paying customers deserting us, and we had no idea what was happening. That meant we really uh, dug into the business model and what uh, really needed to happen uh, to sort of turn, to change the business model so that it can scale. I think it should always be ahead of what customers are going to aspire for. Uh, I don't have a slide in here, but we introduced, so first of all, we changed our business model from the six to eight hours of supply to this hybrid mini grid model that I just talked about in the last few slides, where we combine solar P, a biomass gasification system, uh, and battery and synchronize all the systems together in order to service our customers and provide them with 24 seven power. And that is when we introduced smart prepaid metering system with all these uh, call it fancy tariff management process, so that we can always be ahead of what customers might need. For example, passing customer uh, the cost advantage of solar PV, or launching campaign that will promote daytime use of power. Uh, it was all possible through uh, smart metering uh, technology. So that was a major, major shift um, you can call it a big pivot in the business model uh, or turnaround of the company. Personally, uh, I had, uh, uh, I went through this turnaround process. So we were at 70 plants, we had 300 people, and we were losing a lot of money because our customers were deserting us. Um, so we had to take a very tough call. We had to close a lot of sites. Uh, we had to let you know, more than 50% 50, 50 of the people go in order to fix the business and bring it to the right, uh, sort of in, in a right frame so that we can scale. So that was our 2014 time frame when we really went through this tough process uh, and made all the changes that are required. Of course, business model and technology wise we brought 24-7 power that is grid-like, and we can actually interact with the grid as well. And at the same time, uh, if some of you are going to try and start companies or a company, uh, most founders, including me, we make mistake of not hiring very competent management team. Uh, we typically don't think we can do everything ourselves. Um, that is a misconception. I still, by the way, think I can do most of the things myself. Uh, so I have to teach or uh, myself over and over again that you need to find uh, you know, highly competent people to join your journey so that uh, together you can do much bigger than what you or I can do 
uh, stand alone. Uh, no matter how talented you are or I am, we cannot be expert in every field. Uh, so one of the lessons were uh, you hire, if I had to build you know, two more plants versus hire one more person with the same money, if I had to go back, I'll hire a person, not build those two extra plants. Right? Uh, so those were uh, some of the learnings along the way. Uh, and the third one was around policy. So when we started the company in 2008 and 9, uh, you know, we built these systems. We were very happy. We were under the radar. But in the power or energy sector, you are actually doing infrastructure for a country. And you cannot shy away from uh, policies and interaction and partnership with government. And that was another lesson. Uh, I My background, like I was saying earlier, is electrical engineer, and I have an MBA as well. Uh, but I had no experience whatsoever with policies. So I had to learn that. And I have worked tremendously on policy side to bring mini-grid as a part of national electrification plan of India and now Tanzania as well. Uh, and it took us eight years to get to that in India. India was the first country to announce uh, mini-grid policy and it happened in 2016. Um, and interestingly, the same policy, almost verbatim, was picked by Nigeria in 2016. 17 or 18, and they implemented that policy as well. Uh, so sure, I made some of those mistakes earlier, but I'm also very proud of the fact that uh, we were able to create a sector that did not exist in the world. Uh, so those are some of the uh, learnings and lessons that we have uh, in terms of uh, business plan that we started with and the reality that hit us and how we use that reality and the data to evolve the business model to the next stage and bring a competent management team members to help us do this sort of new or evolved journey. Uh, so when we built these hybrid mini-grid systems, we built about eight or ten of them uh, with the help of us so as a very small equity investor in 2014. Uh, and after that, we showed all the evidence that I'm actually sharing with you guys uh, to these new investors that I talked about, so Shell and NG and others, uh, that got really excited about you know, what is happening with more than 24 months of data to show that it works and it can work at scale. And that is what really helped us raise that $25 million after going through a really, really, really rough patch. Uh, so, you know, the lessons that I have already shared and what also pays off is if you're really tied to the purpose of what you're doing, in our case, um, electrification of everyone in the world uh, to make positive impact in their lives is what is, uh, is the purpose that really excites me every single day. Uh, it makes you more resilient. Uh, of course, I could have, you know, said, this is way too tough. Would have gone back to New York City. I used to work in New York City and uh, got back again. But the purpose of what we were doing, the scale of the problem that we were trying to solve, um, you know, created a lot of resiliency in me as a person. That really helped me go through this very rough patch in the company between 2013 and 20. Uh, so that's uh, those are the key lessons that is what I would share. And uh, another point is, you know, when you're talking to investors, if you're raising money, uh, I was extremely transparent of what happened, why we closed plans, why we let people go, uh, what problems we faced. That also establishes a lot of trust when you're bringing a new set of investors. Uh, because uh, it's better to tell what happened rather than hide that's the basis of building trust with new set of partners. Um, some of the uh, other, uh, I'm going back to the slide now, uh, things that we have observed on electrified villages, literally the, the kerosene use has dropped down to zero in 
every single village we have gone to, uh, which is a tremendous achievement if you can think about pollution that it creates in each household. Uh, I was talking about socioeconomic development. And again, these slides that I'm showing are all done by third party. Uh, we don't do this survey ourselves because we will be completely biased, of course. Uh, so it shows that 85% of our customers, roughly, uh, they have all increased their businesses within the first 12 months of getting 24-7 uh, power from us. Uh, very interestingly, actually the profit, so not just the sales, so that means cost can also go up. Uh, their profits on third, uh, which was a pretty interesting result for us because I did not expect that high uh, profit uh, increase for our commercial customers. Uh, so at this point of time, like when we found the business, we made a major pivot uh, and we went out and raised money from Shell and others. And uh, right now we are uh, scaling at a pretty fast pace. Uh, we had, and before scaling, we had anticipated challenges uh, around scaling, and one was, of course, technology. Uh, uh, from solar PV to biomass to battery, we are always uh, ahead, not ahead, but ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to picking the technology that is right for our purposes. A partnership is also key, so we are trying to so right now uh, in India, we are expanding at the rate of one new mini grid per week. Our goal is to do one every other day. Uh, and that is by Q4 or by say November or December of 2020. In order to reach from one every seven days to one every other day, <coughs> it's not, it's not, and that's where we are looking for a lot of uh, value chain particular like leverage uh, those relationships with the likes of Mahindra, which is a conglomerate or very large corporation in India. But and we are finding partners in other countries as well. Uh, we are a uh, uh, utility business, uh, so we are going to have a large balance sheet. Uh, and in order to do that, we are uh, always looking to get the lowest cost of debt financing that is possible in the world. Uh, and we have actually secured financing from OPEC, which is Overseas Private Investment Corporation in the U.S., uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation. I talked about policy. I, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I had to learn this, but uh, you cannot shy away from the policies. And uh, I am constantly working on policy with multiple government stakeholders uh, around the world. Uh, so we have raised uh, equity, like I was saying, we are looking to add another $20 million of debt on our balance sheet, and that will have us up to 500 integrated sites um, in India and across two different countries in Africa. Uh, we are in Tanzania, like I said, we might get into say, Nigeria and other countries. And, yeah. uh, so in summary, you know, we have a Western class uh, model now, after having made very many mistakes, I think we have a right model. Uh, of course, we will keep going. Uh, and like I was saying earlier, what with multi stakeholders is key in your business. And uh, we are talking about the new partners and, and uh, stakeholders in the value chain. Uh, and lately, we are working on a platform that includes uh, IoT that can manage a fleet of assets. Right? So, when I have one power plant, or even 10 or 20 power plants, it is one thing to manage them. But when we are looking at 300 to 500 power plants to manage
Lanaj? Oh, we, we seem to have an uh, audio pause here. Are you still there, Manoj? Manoj, um, we, we may have lost you for a second. Do you want to dial us back in? Oh, potentially Manoj got disconnected, so I'll give us a moment to, for him to reconnect. I think I'm um, and, connected again. And uh, there we go. Welcome you. back. Thank you. Yeah, I was about to try to <laughs> complete your presentation without you. Thank you <laughs> for that. Uh, so these are challenges actually we face in the field as well. We do have IoT based but we have outages. Uh, so it is quite interesting and tricky to build a technology platform that can solve uh, these kind of problems in real life. Uh, so that's, oh, uh, I don't think I have the control on the slide moment, or do I? Uh, in any case, so that was the last last slide. So we are looking to expand quite rapidly, uh, again, from one power plant that we install or one whole site that we install per week, uh, one new site every other week, uh, every other day, excuse me. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we need a lot of uh, partners to, to accomplish that. And I was saying we are pushing for policy on the that can become part of the national electrification program uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it is uh, going to be cheaper than expanding main grid for hundreds of kilometers to reach rural parts of the world. And two, as, as, you, as we have seen in, in you know, California and, and many other regions of the world, you know, the entire region was dot decentralized assets or mini grid kind of uh, program provides resiliency against those kind of uh, shocks that from nature. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, pause. We are quite excited about scaling in India and many countries in Africa. Uh, and I'm sure we will make some more mistakes, but the key is to learn yeah. from them quickly and, <laughs> and keep going. Thank you so much, Manoj. I appreciate that you. Stop. Yeah, thank you for being so transparent. And yes, I think all of us, um, the one thing we can't guarantee beyond death and taxes is that we'll all make mistakes along the way. The important thing is certainly to learn from those. So we have a number of questions that have come in, and I'm really excited to uh, dig into these. Um, one that um, immediately struck me is, um, you know, in terms of the you're seeing this productive use from your customers. I was, I was really interested to see that one of the devices listed was printers. Uh, I did not I expected freezers and refrigerators, but printers was actually a little surprise for me. Very interesting. Um, so the question here from the audience, from our listeners, is: Do you also supply? the energy efficient end user devices to maximize the benefits of the electricity that you supply? Uh, yes, that's a good question. So we uh, used to not do that uh, until 2015, I think, uh, but we started uh, providing energy efficient appliances to our customers. Uh, so we do have partnerships with the likes of uh, Havels in India or LG, uh, Samsung and the like, to, uh, to be able to provide our customers with a very high quality appliance that, you know, again, you and I can get uh, in major cities of the world. What is really interesting is, uh, you know, people in the rural area, they get the, the bad uh, deal all the time. So they will get more expensive item with a poor quality, yeah. which doesn't make sense. Uh, so we have tried to change that paradigm by bringing to their doorstep as simple as LG TV, which is LED, and mm -hmm. at a price that is cheaper than what they could get in the, in the closest market uh, that they have access to. So it helps them and it helps us. Of course, we do make some money on that, and uh, they get to enjoy uh, 
the better things at a cheaper price point. Of course, no, that's critically important. Um, so a couple more questions related to uh, the power plant itself. So one listener wants to know, um, how do you identify the power plant sites? Um, and transport the sources of biomass to each site. Uh, in particular, uh, this listener wants to know if the local community or customers are involved in that process in any way. Uh, right, so the, the first part of the question is about uh, identifying a site where we want to build them. Uh, that is actually uh, almost a billion dollar question because it took us eight years to figure it out. Um, it is not that trivial. Uh, because, of course, we have to uh, not just gen generate electricity and distribute it. We also, since we invest a large amount of capital in these assets, we also need to get prepaid on those assets. So we have a variety of site selection process and criteria uh, that make sure that our investment that we are making uh, is going to get some return. Will be back up before we go to the next one. Uh, so that's uh, more on the economic side, but also the customer segment that I alluded to earlier. So we have figured out what is the right mix for us uh, that will generate economic return for us, uh, make the business sustainable, and it is helpful uh, for the entire community. We have those sort of uh, quantified and helps us do the selection. As far as procurement, so we are always involved in the community. So each site that we build, we always hire local people. We never parachute people from cities to do the day-to-day uh, -day operations and maintenance. So electrician and operator are always local to that village or maybe a neighboring village. Uh, so that really builds a lot of, uh, 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 I don't know what the right phase is, but it, it gives us a lot of uh, attachment to the local community. Uh, and a third question I think was about biomass uh, pro uh, procurement. Uh, so when we select site, that is also one of the criteria that go into it. Um, we do select sites that are around say rice mills. Uh, and the rice mills should not be more than and eight to ten kilometers or five to six miles of the land, uh, and that way the transportation cost of biomass uh, is not very high. Mm -hmm. So this this question actually piggybacks off that one uh, or dovetails into it. So um, the listener wanted to know that uh, when the technology was created or when you developed these plants, how did you convince people to use the new technology? Uh, it seems that your presence in the community was obviously a critical factor to that. Um, do, you, do you want to expand on that a little bit more uh, in terms of how did you um, assure your target customers that this was the way to go? All right, so uh, customer is not that uh, people who are using whatever they're using, whether it is diesel gen set or kerosene lantern or even a candle, um, you know, we as a human being, we have a lot of inertia. We don't want to change. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have created a program uh, which is a very uh, uh, stepwise awareness program that creates this, uh, you know, so you know, we have a simple messaging system that tells our potential customers of why we are you know, more beneficial to them than the alternatives that they might be using at, at the time. And we bring, so nowadays with, with all the digital and smartphones becoming less than $100 per piece, a lot of people do have smartphones. So we bring a tablet with a customer testimonial from the neighboring site. And that helps us create a lot of awareness and buy in into what we are providing. So it's not a trivial process, but uh, it's, a, it's a very focused approach to demonstrate the benefit uh, of what we do and how it helps them. So from both economic perspective, from the living standard perspective, and a lot of time, very interestingly, uh, you know, uh, 
which is neighbors and NV. If somebody has LG TV, the neighbor also wants to have an LG TV. Yeah. Uh, so that also works. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to keep up with the Joneses. It's a universal concept. <laughs> um, so then, <laughs> right. This, yeah, this kind of customer education is is as you mentioned, not trivial. It's a large investment and. The second part of, of the listener's question regarding the implementation of these rural areas, whether you received support for that or some funding to pilot test, uh, or whether the users themselves, such as cooperatives or such, paid uh, to kind of uh, pilot the technology. Uh, that's a how to answer that. Uh, so we did receive some support from government when we were doing uh, biomass gasification system when we started the company in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came in, in the form of subsidies. Uh, so that was one help. Uh, we also received some grant financing from foundations, the likes of Shell Foundation. So you know, always approach grant providers to do the initial pilot or test the hypothesis mm -hmm. or concept that you might have. And if you're playing in the energy sector, there's a lot of government programs um, that are always available and can be tapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, exciting to see, or I think critical to acknowledge the, the amount of time you've invested in uh, policy development and, and engaging with government agencies, both from the perspective of growing the sector at large, but also from the perspective of business development, which it seems to me that you know was really effective for you. So on the note of supporting organizations, another listener wanted to know whether engineering organizations like, for example, IEEE or nonprofits like EWB, Engineers Without Borders, supported you at all in, in your efforts or if you did this without those kinds of engagements? Uh, so, personally, uh, I used to write papers when I was my master's a long time ago. That, that is my association, association with IEEE. Uh, <laughs> after that, I haven't really uh, read IEEE papers or uh, taken any assistance on this front. Actually, I didn't know that there was something available. Uh, so that's on the IEEE front. Uh, we have not, I know engineering without borders, uh, but in our case, we did not work uh, or took help from them uh, directly. Mm -hmm. Not these two at least. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have taken help from a lot of foundations uh, to enter a new country or test a new hypothesis and such. Fantastic. So I know we're at time, but I have a question that I'm curious about. You mentioned how important and critical it is to hire a competent management team, and I, I very much uh, violently agree with you that you know one person, no matter how talented, cannot do it all. Um, as a mom, I know this as well. <laughs> so I would love to know what if you can speak to what does the management team look like now? What what are some of those key hires that you made that you think really took you over the line? Right, so when we were going through a really, really difficult time in 2013, uh, I, I, I do believe in mentorship quite a bit. I did have a mentor uh, since 2009. Uh, and he's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. He started two companies. Uh, I feel both of them. Uh, so he has all the credentials, I guess. But he was a really good mentor to me. It, does, it didn't really matter to me whether he I would a company or not. Uh, mm -hmm. He was really able to connect to me, and he was really able to guide me when I was, uh, you know, seeking some kind of guidance or seeking some type of uh, help. Uh, so I actually brought him on our board as an independent director in 2013. And uh, he willingly accepted it when we were going through a really rough time. A lot of people actually would not. Uh, why join a sinking ship, right? Uh, but that is a test of mentorship, I guess, uh, and the relationship. So that was a very critical piece uh, in terms of bringing a very highly competent uh, ex-CEO and founder of multiple companies, successful companies, uh, on the 
board uh, to keep me honest. Like he was not going to uh, sugarcoat his words, right? Mm -hmm. So that was, you can say, stupid or brave of me uh, to to bring that kind of person um, who can be very very direct and honest. Uh, apart from that, uh, actually he is the one who helped me hire other management team members that included. Uh, chief operating officer, he brings about 25 to 30 years of experience. Uh, we brought uh, head of engineering, we brought uh, finance controller, we brought head of HR. Uh, so these were some very uh, high level, and, sorry, and another one is uh, head of Africa business. So these are pretty competent people. A lot of them came from a combination of startup and corporate with more than 15, 20 years of experience. Mm -hmm. That has really solidified uh, our management team. Phenomenal. Um, we do have, uh, we are at time, so I know many of you will be dropping off, but there's one question that came in, and I think it's a great one to kind of end on. Um, a listener wants to know, what has enabled you to be the LCOE provider when a large number of mini grid and micro grid operators have struggled to be financially sustainable. Yeah, it's a very important question. Everybody will have the answer. <laughs> uh, but uh, so LCO is uh, essentially levelized cost of energy. So what is it that it cost us to deliver one kilowatt hour of energy is what this question is about. Uh, and at a very high level, of course, the technology or the hybrid technology that we are using uh, enables us to lower the cost, uh, which is a right design to combine uh, very uniquely in our case, solar PV, biomass gasification, and the right sizing of the batteries. Uh, so that's one piece. Second piece is we have been running so many mini grids for the last 10 years have codified all those learnings and mistakes into an algorithm. So we don't make those mistakes, so it, those are ruled out, and we continue and repeat what really works. So when I say those are codified, these are not dependent on me or our COO or anybody else. It is actually an algorithm that runs on the IoT. Uh, so that's another piece. Uh, third is uh, just the uh, the customer acquisition that we briefly touched upon, that is extremely non-trivial. Uh, no matter how low your cost is, if you cannot acquire customers, it can never be sustainable. Um, making sure that your cash flow is uh, very predictable. Uh, LCOE is also a function of utilization of asset during daytime and nighttime. And the customer acquisition and the right mix of customers allows us to have the capacity utilization of the plant fairly constant between day and night time that most mini grid players are not able to do, and even the likes of PGNE or Con Edison are not able to do. It's a very non trivial problem to solve. I'm not saying we have cracked the code, but we have tried to do it better than others. Uh, so these are the top three reasons that I would say ha have enabled us to be the lowest cost LCOE company in the world in the mini grid sector. And that is a tremendous accomplishment, Manoj, and I, I would like to thank you so very much for your honest and transparent uh, sharing with us today. The lessons you've learned, I, I hope, will be meaningful to our listeners on this webinar and on the recording which will follow this webinar. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today. I'd like to thank you, Manoj. I'd like to thank our listeners for joining us from all around the world. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for you setting aside uh, some time during your incredibly busy schedule uh, running this phenomenal company. So for those of you who are listening and interested in PDH certification, the link is available on this slide. If you have more questions and we didn't address them, do feel free to reach out to us. Uh, via the email address listed here. And of course, don't forget to become an E4C member to get more information on upcoming webinars. And with that, I wish you all a good evening, good night, uh, good morning, depending where you are. And I hope to see you all on our next E4C webinar. Have a good day. Bye-bye now.
Thank you, everyone. Bye.